Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. This is the sixth and last message in our series, Made for More. I have been trying to express that I believe that all followers of Christ are made for more than most of us are experiencing, and that the church is made for more than it's currently uh, doing. Uh, I have talked about six paradigm shifts. The first one was from more effort to more Jesus. Uh, the first thought is when you think, well, I need to be experiencing more, I, uh, that my church needs to uh, have more impact, I should work harder. No, it's from more effort shift to more Jesus. Jesus is the one that makes the impact on this world. Only as we depend on Him can we make a big difference. Second paradigm shift is from more volunteers to more masterpieces. Most churches have pastors. Pastors decide what we're going to do, and then they draw lines. We need this many volunteers to make Kids Space go on Sunday morning. We need this many volunteers to make the youth program go. We need this many volunteers to make the, the worship ministry go, and, and on it goes. The shift needs to be from more volunteers to more masterpieces to help every one of us understand you're a masterpiece. God has uniquely gifted you and called you to make a difference in this world. Yeah, we still need volunteers to serve in positions in the church, but the main thing is we want to help you know who God has made you to be. And maybe what God has made you to be will be something in the church. But maybe your main calling is, is out there during the week. The third paradigm shift is from more guilt to more love. So how do we get people to experience more? How do we get the church to make a bigger difference in the world? Do pastors get up and guilt you into it? Come on, you can do it. Get out there. No. Paul says no. We don't motivate people with guilt, but with love. We come to understand how much God loves us. And out of that fullness, we're so filled up that we can't help but love the people God has put in our lives and minister to them. The fourth paradigm shift is from more hierarchy to more missionaries. Most churches are set up with the pastors at the top, leaders in the church, and, and uh, we want to move away from that of seeing that the pastors are the only ones that can minister to more missionaries. Every one of us is a missionary. Every one of us is called by God to make an impact in this world. We're all called by God to pastor people far from God in our lives. We want to have a, a whole mindset change where you say, you know what? I'm a pastor to these people God has put in my life. And we begin to think differently. We see ourselves differently. The fifth paradigm is for more programs to more mission fields. The church can't set up enough programs to saturate Portland with Christ. The only way we're going to reach Portland is through each one of us. I often say when people say, how, how, how large is Portland Community Church? I say, well, if we counted every person like that comes on Easter and maybe add, count a couple of their dogs, we'd be about 600. Can you imagine if 600 of us were seeing ourselves as pastors to people far from God everywhere we go, what God might do this year? Yeah. The fifth paradigm shift is today's from more strategy to more surrender. It's similar to the first one. Instead of just thinking strategy, okay, what can we do differently? It's more surrender to Christ and the Holy Spirit because He's the one that provides the power. As we depend more on Jesus, spread the truth about Jesus to people in our lives, not out of guilt, but out of love, Recognize that we've all been gifted by God, not just the pastors, 
to minister to people who don't know Christ. Recognize that programs in the church are not going to be enough to saturate Portland, but all of us going out to the mission fields God has already put us in. Satan will do everything in his power to stop us. Now, I brought some spices here today. Don't tell Jory. Slipped them out of the kitchen. If I don't have them back by 5 p.m. tonight, I'll be making a special trip back to get them. All right, so these represent what a typical church does. Typical church wants to see people saved. So we want to see people that don't know Christ come to know Christ and give their lives to Him. We want to see people healed. People come to church for one of three reasons. One, they've been invited by somebody that goes to that church. They say, you got to come, our minister of music. You're going to love it. you got to come hear what our pastor's talking about this week. Second reason people come is because they're curious about God. Something happens in their life. Maybe they've known nothing about Christ, and they, their interest is piqued, and so they want to inquire about God. Third reason people come to church, and I think it's the main reason, is something going on in their lives, some trauma, some terrible things going on. Many people come to their lives, their lives are wrecked, and they're looking for something to help them. They need to be healed. Third thing churches want to do is to set people free. More people today than at any time in our country's history are living with addictions. They are in bondage. They need to be set free. Then the church wants to see people discipled. We don't just want people to give their lives to Christ. We want to see them grow in Christ and understand their faith. We want them to read the Bible and understand how to uh, interpret it for themselves. We want them to, to, to meditate on the Bible. That's why we do our journal. So you can actually write about verses and what they actually mean. We put a memory verse at the front of each lesson so that you can uh, memorize. By the way, this is a new one, beginning. So we're starting a new series next week based on the book of Genesis. And so if you haven't picked one up, this is for next week. The memory verse is something you can memorize and you can think about it as you go through your week. That's meditating on God's Word. So we want to see people get discipled. Then the church wants to see people equipped. If every one of us is a pastor to people far from God in our lives, we, most of us would say, I I can't do that. I don't have any clue. So we want you to feel equipped to know that you can minister to people in your lives. And then we want them empowered. You cannot reach people in your life that don't know Christ on your own. It just isn't going to work. You have to have the Holy Spirit. And so we want to help people become empowered. And then finally, we want people ministering. We want every one of us, Monday through Sunday, ministering wherever God has put us. Now, most churches don't don't do these two. They kind of just do these other five. They don't do healing. They don't do setting people free. It's kind of like they're overlooked or they don't know how to do it. They're missing pieces in churches. Uh, Ones who come to our discipleship groups and our community groups are our good Boy Scouts. Ones who need healing and freedom are dealing with addictions and dysfunctional family backgrounds. They're struggling. Pastors get frustrated with them. They don't show up for meetings. They're inconsistent in coming to church. They need a lot of counseling that pastors don't have time to give. Typically, pastors meet with them one or two times, then they refer them to counselors or city services. This is an opportunity for growth in our church. If you feel like this is something that you would have some strengths in and interest in, Let me know. Let us know that you'd like to help with this. A year ago, 
I said to you, one of the areas we need to strengthen in our church is this whole area of care and crisis. A year ago, the way it would work is if somebody was in the hospital or somebody was shut in and they, they just couldn't get out, I was kind of the main guy. And I was just getting further and further behind and feeling more and more inadequate and like, I just can't do this. And so I brought it up and uh, actually it came from the board. And, uh, and so 12 of you came forward and say, I could help with that. I got gifts of mercy and, and compassion. And, and I think nine of you have been active and we're so much better this year than we were a year ago. So this is another area, healing and setting people free. If you feel like you could offer something in that area, please let me know. How do you get this thing going? Well, it starts at the top. The head leader. I have to be honest that I have weaknesses. I struggle with issues. It's not like that there are just a few people in our church being attacked by spiritual forces of evil. Satan wants to take us all down. He knows the wrong ways of thinking that we've embraced maybe since our childhood. And he wants to exploit these weaknesses to defeat us. We all need to be honest so we can take away the stigma of counseling and addictions. We all need to to admit that we have strongholds, areas that Satan can use in our lives to defeat us. Americans were first introduced to terrorism in a big way on 9-11. 19 terrorists slipped into our country and pulled off a devilish plot that took the lives of 3,000 Americans. Since then, the U.S. government has foiled dozens of terrorist plots. But many others got through. Bali, London, Paris, Manchester, Kenyan, the Boston Marathon. There also have been many mass shootings, Las Vegas, Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook, Aurora, Colorado, El Paso, Dayton. There's too many to remember. I mean, those are ones I just picked out of my head. I didn't even look them up. Talking heads on TV tell us how to solve those problems. Take away guns, have better background checks, and increase our services to the mentally ill. But I've never heard one mention the number one cause behind these things. I've seen people arguing on TV, both sides, what's going to make a difference until their heads look like they're going to blow up. But I've never heard them mention the number one cause of these terrorist attacks and mass shootings. Spiritual forces of evil. I'll bet you that 99 out of 100 terrorist attacks and mass shooting, spiritual forces of evil were behind these saying, you can pull this off. These people deserve to die. Do it. Before you write me off, say, wait a minute. Are you going to blame every bad thing that happens in this world on creatures we've never seen? Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes as he ends the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 6, 10 to 19. Turn in your Bible. If you want to use the Bibles under the seats, it's on page 1,177. Paul has told us in this book about God's great plan to reconcile every human being in this world under the Lordship of Christ. He's told about his plan to build the church, people who commit their lives to Christ, followers who are filled with, so much with the love of Christ that they take that fullness to their families, their places of work, their schools, their clubs, their athletic teams, their neighborhoods. It sounds almost too good to be true. And sure enough, Paul then tells us about spiritual forces of evil who hate God. And are trying to frustrate God's plan 
to save people in this world. They want to put people to death. You can't tell me that spiritual forces are not behind the huge increase in suicides. They want to keep people from Christ. Now, even if you don't believe me that Satan is behind many of the evil things that happen in this world, at least listen to what the Apostle Paul says. Finally, he's wrapping up his book. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. What a line. In one sentence, Paul says, we all have it wrong. We think the problem in this world is a leader. We think the problem in this world is a country. An ideology. Paul says, no, your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. Now he lists a hierarchy of spiritual forces of evil that serve Satan, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, before we go any further, let's pray. Lord God, I have never written a message about spiritual forces of darkness without being attacked. I've never spoken about this subject without seeing something happen. And so we pray your protection on everyone here today. And Father, wherever there is darkness, where there is thinking that these creatures do not exist, would you shed light? Wherever there's a need for healing and to break free from bondage, would you show your truth and expose the forces of darkness we're ready to hear? In Jesus' name, amen. What does Paul tell us about spiritual forces of darkness? He tells us four things. One, they are real. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul says they are real. If you hold a materialist view that if you can't see it, then it doesn't exist, or a modernist view that belief in demons is primitive thinking, then you're going to be at a decided disadvantage in a battle against spiritual forces of evil. Jesus believed in Satan. When Jesus said he was going to die on a cross, Peter says, Jesus, no, 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 no. You're not going to be put to death on a cross. You know what Jesus replied? He says, get behind me, Satan. He knew that behind Peter's pea brain thinking were spiritual forces of evil. And we need to know the same thing today. Behind religions, behind ideologies that are anti-God, behind terrible leaders are spiritual forces of evil. Behind chaos and turmoil. Paul says they're real. Jesus, since Jesus taught that he was going to die on the cross and three days later be raised from the dead, then he pulled it off. I'm going to go with Jesus' teaching on Satan. In fact, I'm going to go with Jesus' teaching on every subject. Jesus says spiritual forces of evil are real. Two, they are cunning. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Paul says they have schemes. They are cunning. One of the most cunning schemes of spiritual forces of evil is to convince us that they do not exist. 
Satan's just a metaphor for evil. Pollster George Barner on April 10th, 2009, asked self-described Christians to respond to this statement. Satan is not a living being, but is a symbol of evil. 40% agreed. 19% somewhat agreed. 8% weren't sure what to believe about Satan. Add them together and you get 67% of self-described Christians probably do not believe in Satan. Wow. They are so cunning, they've convinced us they don't exist. One of Satan's lies that he's foisted on the church is that only pastors can minister. The rest of us are just to listen, observe, put a little money in the offering. One of the big ideas in this series has been that we are all ministers. We've all been called by God and gifted by God to be pastors to the people in our lives who don't know Christ. Another lie Satan has managed to get many Christians to believe is that the church is the building. Ministry only happens in the church facilities. The truth is, most ministry happens Monday through Saturday. As you go with the fullness of Christ to the peoples in your families, your schools, your places where you work, your neighborhoods, your clubs. Three, they are powerful. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He calls them powers, forces. They have powers. They are powers. They have the power to inspire terrorist attacks and mass shootings and suicides. For they are evil. Their purpose is to kill and destroy and to keep people from Christ and to stir up turmoil. I have no doubt that the spiritual forces of evil are laughing all the way to hell about all the tension, dissension, and turmoil they've stirred up in our political discourse. How can we equip our people to battle against spiritual forces of evil? What would be some of the elements we would need in a healing and freedom ministry? Paul writes from prison where he's chained to a Roman guard 24-7. So he uses imagery of military garb. Why don't you read this with me, verses 13 to 18. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit, On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Paul describes six pieces of military armor. I don't have time to go deeply into each one, so I'll summarize it with two statements. First, arm yourself with God's Word. Paul tells us to put on the belt of truth. The truth comes from God's Word. And the helmet of salvation. It's from God's Word that we learn that if we've given our lives to Christ, we're saved. We're forgiven. And the sword of the Spirit. Paul tells us the sword of the Spirit means the Word of God. The Word of God tells us that Jesus is the Son of God, and we need Him in our lives. If you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, one thing I know about you is you are being influenced by spiritual forces of evil. 
One of Satan's biggest lies is that Jesus is not the Son of God. When Jesus was baptized by uh, John, God spoke from the heavens and said, This is my beloved Son. Then the Gospel writers tell us that the next thing that happened was Satan led Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted. In his very first temptation, he says, If you are the Son of God. The first thing he did was to call into doubt that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus responds by speaking the Word of God to him, and Satan slinks off with his tail between his legs. The Word of God informs us that that there are spiritual forces of evil that are real. It assures us that even though they are cunning, powerful, and evil, Christ is more powerful. Now, this is why I talk so often about the importance of you reading the Bible. My desire for every one of you is to spend a little bit of time every day reading the Bible. This is why we make these journals. They enable you to have something to read and then to meditate on it. By writing, we, you have to fill in answers. You're meditating on what the words of the Bible mean. And then we always put a memory verse at the beginning. We want you to memorize it so you can think about it during the week. If you jump out of bed and fly into your day without spending time with Christ, you set yourself up to believe the lies of Satan. And then you're more vulnerable to be worried, stressed, discouraged, and defeated. God's Word helps us understand the curious line in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Many people read that and think, does does God lead us into temptation? Really? These words trouble even the most sophisticated theologian, but they don't trouble a child. This is a prayer for those who see God as their father. A father was walking with his son down a steep hill when the weather had gotten cold and there were icy patches on the road. And he said, please walk slowly. Be careful. But the boy was too excited. He took off running, and sure enough, his legs went up, his bottom went down. Well, then he came back to his father and held his hand. He said, Daddy, I'm so sorry. Please help me not slip on another slippery spot. Please help me not to fall. That's what Jesus tells us to pray. Ask God to deliver us from temptation and the evil one. Help us not to fall. Two, arm yourself with prayer. Paul tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Shoe our feet with the gospel of peace. The breastplate of righteousness would mean like holiness, living a a good life. But you can't do that without prayer. You have to pray minute by minute for God to help you stay with Him. And to shoe our feet with the gospel of peace, that means to be able and willing to share Christ with other people. But you can't do that without first praying, God, I'm open, but give me, give me some words. Protect ourselves with the shield of faith. We get that by prayer. Otherwise, we go to doubt and disbelieving. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. This one verse, Paul tells us how to pray. Verse 18. Read this with me. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. So we're to pray in the Spirit. That means we have to ask the Spirit what to pray. Guide us as we pray. We're to pray on all occasions. We don't just pray in the morning, one and done. We pray through the day. We're to pray all kinds of prayers. That would include prayers of praise, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of confession. 
were to make requests. I've told you before that this word for request means be specific. God says, well, what do you want? Spell it out. And then be alert. Then you can be alert for God's answers to prayer if you've been specific in asking. Always keep on praying. Paul says, don't give up. You don't just pray once and say, well, I guess God didn't want to give that. And pray for all God's people. We live in a world that is terrifying. Spiritual forces of evil love to bring chaos into our world, our places of work, our schools, our political discourse, our churches, and our families. We can't overcome them on our own power. It's impossible. We must surrender to Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Many people in the church need healing. They need to be set free from bondage before they can do more for Christ. Read this final line with me. I believe followers of Christ must surrender themselves to Christ's power to battle against the spiritual forces of evil. Lord God, thank you for your word, that it's true. Thank you for inspiring the Apostle Paul to teach us that these forces are real and that much of what we battle with in our jobs and schools and families and society is stirred up by forces of evil behind that want to destroy and create turmoil and to kill and to keep people from Christ. Sorry for not believing that, God. We confess that. And now we want to arm ourselves so we're ready for the battle with your word and prayer. Lord, help us to spend time each day with you in your word. Help us to see that it it is that important. It's life or death. To meditate on it. Write. And then help us to pray. Pray each morning and then pray through the day. And pray at night. You want to make that commitment to God? You pray right now. Tell Him, I believe that there are forces of evil, and I want to arm myself with the Word and with prayer. You pray. Lord, let us not be ignorant, foolish, by not recognizing that there is an enemy who wants to keep us from Christ and keep us from following Christ and making a difference in this world and help us arm ourselves with your word this week. Lord, we want to spend time with you and in prayer. We can't face these huge obstacles in our world without praying. So we commit ourselves to doing that this week in Jesus' name. Amen.